All right, beautiful people. Today, we will be looking at migration and revolution. We will see the rise of modern humans, who we are, you and I, um, and the Neolithic revolution, which will fundamentally change human history forever. Now, with this course, we are going to go to a number of places, a number of places. But just know, please know this, that prehistoric, prehistoric means before writing. And so this class will focus on societies and cultures that left a written word, that left copious amounts of, of writing, uh, material evidence. Um, that's what historians work with. We work with the written word. Um, certainly, uh, anthropologists, archaeologists look at other societies, but just know, but just know that for much of the world outside of East Asia, the Middle East, uh, parts of Europe, um, they existed in a state of prehistory, prehistoric, um, and so we won't be looking at them. Um, please don't attach uh, a value to prehistoric versus historic societies. Um, it just is the nature of the beast. Um, and also know that everything that we cover, everything that we cover uh, could be its own graduate course. Um, we are doing a very, very humble perusal of major civilizations, uh, major societies um, in the first part of human history, roughly 4,000 BCE to about 1600. That is where most historians mark the beginning of the modern age, the age in which we live in. So again, this is a very humble, brief perusal of major civilizations throughout the world. The rise of humans, the rise of humans. Well, we haven't been here very long. We haven't been here very long. If the history of the planet was a day, if the history of the planet was a day, that's about four and a half billion years. Um, so we put four and a half billion years into 24 hours. Uh, modern humans have been here about three seconds, about three seconds of a 24 hour day. Dinosaurs didn't even show up. Um, if, the, uh, 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 if, if right now we are at 1159 uh, uh, minutes and 59 seconds, dinosaurs didn't even show up to the party until 1046 p.m. So that gives you an idea. That gives you an idea of how brief we've been here. As far as civilization goes, and we'll, beginning, we'll begin to look at what is civilization. Uh, civilization has been around for about 0.1 seconds. And the industrial age, the age that we live in with factories, roads, public schools, the welfare state, et cetera, about 0.0. Zero one seconds. Modern man, Homo sapien sapien, was born about 120,000 years ago in East Africa um, and then scattered out among the world, throughout the world. Um, we are the last extant species of human, although there were others. Um, we control fire, we make clothes, language, we're capable of introspective thought, self awareness complex language, uh, religion. We often, we will for a number of ages thought that humans were the only animals that, that fought and fornicated for fun, but we know that's not true either. Uh, dolphins, monkeys, other species will fight and fornicate for fun. We also thought that we were the only species that indulged in, in alcohol or, or certain uh, drugs. We know that's not true either. Certain animals will visit certain trees certain times of the year in order to escape their reality. So we're still learning. All of this is, is, is very, very, and again, we're going over very brief uh, 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 perusal of all of these things. But we are Homo sapien sapien. Uh, we are Homo sapien sapien. Um, we weren't the only ones. We know that we weren't the only ones. There were other humanoid um, uh, species uh, that we may have even lived alongside with. We know we lived alongside the Neanderthal and other species. Uh, we even interbred with the Neanderthal. Europeans and people from the Near East and parts of the Middle East just have up to 5% uh, Neanderthal blood. Um, but in the end, we win. 
we win. These other species of humanoids uh, become extinct, whether it through be through uh, uh, just simple uh, natural uh, phenomenon, starving to death, uh, maybe being killed off by modern humans or other species, or uh, absorbed. In the case of Neanderthal, again, we do know, and there are pockets of East Asia that also have uh, uh, other um, humanoid uh, bloodlines, which is very, very interesting. We are all the way to the right, Homo sapien sapien, and that's uh, modern man. We are focusing on them, but just please know that we weren't the only ones. Had a few tricks of fate changed things, uh, uh, we'd be very, very, we'd be a very different world today. This is a fun graph. This is the history of the world in the form of an American football field. Um, modern man is a pin line. Dinosaurs, the two yard line that shows you how brief, how brief we've been on this earth and the industrial revolution, one tenth of a human hair right there in front of the goalpost. And so that gives you an idea of how very, very brief our time on this earth as a species has been. We are going to be discussing the uh, 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 Mesolithic and the Neolithic ages. That is, the Stone Age is broken into three parts. We have the Old Stone Age, the Middle Stone Age, and the New Stone Age. We'll be looking at the Paleolithic Age, but our focus will be mostly on the Neolithic Age, and that's when that great revolution takes place. Early migrations, early migrations. We were hunter-gatherers. We were hunter-gatherers, and we needed vast amounts of land in order to survive. Estimates have it at two people needed two square miles in order to survive. And this creates tremendous pressure on these hunting bands of humans. And this is how we existed in our earliest of ages. By 25,000 BCE, modern humans inhabit most of the known globe most of the known globe. We leave Africa, we tame fire, and we begin to spread out. There are humans in the Near East by 125,000 years ago, South Asia, 50,000, Europe, 43,000, East Asia, 30,000, Australia, 40,000 years ago, the Americas, they crossed the Great Bering Bridge um, from East Asia into the Americas, by 25,000 years ago. Polynesia, the uh, Pacific Islands were the last to be inhabited by humans and that was about 3,300 years ago. And so we fan out in search of food, in search of, of, of safety. We know, or at least we believe we know, that life for humans began in East Africa because they have the highest uh, 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 um, diversity as far as blood types go. And so think of uh, humans as a big jar of pickled vegetables. Africa, this region of Africa, this Eastern Asian of Africa has the highest amount of vegetables, right? And so the cauliflowers went off into Europe, the uh, pickled cucumbers and the radishes went off into Asia, but the cauliflowers kept going into uh, 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 North and South America. Does that make sense to you guys? And so this is, and the earliest forms of human are found in East Africa. And so this is the overwhelmingly accepted hypothesis. We were searching for food and we were traveling with herds of animals, most likely. And with the uh, pacification, with the control of fire, now we can live in a great many different places. We can eat a great many different things. This changes everything. We can live everywhere from Alaska um, to uh, Scandinavia um, with fire, fire for cooking, for protection, for light, etc. That was a major, major, major shift in human history. We are hunter-gatherer societies. Um, during the Paleolithic era, we form hunter-gatherer societies. Population growth within these societies was quite slow, um, partly because women extended breastfeeding to limit their fertility. Having many children in a hunter-gatherer society is not necessarily a fantastic thing. That'll change when we enter the agricultural age. But in a hunter-gatherer societies, children slow you down. It's one more mouth to feed. And so population growth was quite slow. We most likely practiced infanticide as well, um, the killing of infants at birth. Um, gender roles. Certainly, we believe there were gender roles. Men hunted and women gathered 
um, nuts, berries, etc. cetera. Uh, women work harder in these societies, certainly, but there was greater equality between the sexes in these hunter gathering societies. And we are lucky enough to actually have records of these uh, societies. Uh, caves have been found in Southern France and Northern Spain uh, that show our Paleolithic ancestors at work. Um, art, art was produced so many thousands of years ago, absolutely breathtaking examples of Paleolithic art on the walls and uh, ceilings of these caves. Were these ceremonial? Uh, maybe. Were they recreational? It could be. Um, we don't, we can't put too much into these, can we? We, we want to think, oh no, this is a fertility temple to, uh, and, and a maiden might spend her night there. Um, or these are just some guys having a good time or girls having a good time and producing art. Um, many of these species are no longer found in Europe, but their bones are. And so we know, we know these are based off of real animals. Uh, Picasso, Pablo Picasso visited these caves um, and was inspired. He thought everything we, we thought we knew about art, they knew thousands of years ago. And it actually forced him to re-examine the way he approached art, which is very interesting that we are still being inspired by art from tens of thousands of years ago. Absolutely amazing to put your hand there and to know that 37,000 years ago, uh, another hand was there. Diversification, it's during this time where the human species becomes diverse because of a number of reasons, because of geography, based on your environment. Um, mutation, uh, the human uh, species mutates as do all, and so that creates diversification. Um, it is now where we begin to see a difference within the human species. Um, uh, you can call it ancestry, you can call it race, um, but this is when we begin to see the human species branching off and, and, and appearing quite different. Uh, racial characteristics is what uh, they would have called it, uh, 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 you know, in the 1800s when they were breaking down all of these groups. It is also during this time where distinct languages emerge. Uh, there were thousands of more languages uh, 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 in past ages than we have now, up to 6,000 distinct languages at its height. But again, based on isolation, geography, mutation, uh, a climate, uh, we begin to branch off into different uh, 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 physical characteristics during this time. Religion, what do we know about Paleolithic religion? Well, not a whole lot, but we certainly believe there were forms of religion. Um, different religious beliefs develop, uh, found across Asia and Europe are what we believe uh, religious artifacts. Why was religion developed? Well, there's a number of reasons, right? Uh, we can all speculate. Um, rules for certain types of behavior. Um, ways of explaining the natural world. Ways of explaining uh, uh, good things and bad things happening to people. A, a way to bring order to a disordered world. Uh, ceremonies to bless the hunt. Maybe to lessen the fear of death. Um, there is evidence of, of, of religious artifacts um, found. Um, for example, there are bear cult figurines found in Central Europe. Other forms of, of animal worship, um, ancestor worship most likely. Here is Lion Man found 30,000 years ago. Was this to protect you on the hunt? Um, was this to give you the bravery found in a lion? We can only speculate but we know that 30,000 years ago, this lion man was produced. We also find in the Paleolithic age, um, graves that seem to be put down with particular care. Um, we are caring for our dead. We might even put down certain artifacts with our dead. Is that to uh, help them in the next world? We can only speculate, but know that even during the Paleolithic age, um, forms of religion were forming. Um, that is, that tends to be a human phenomenon um, found in human species throughout the world, depending on their uh, uh, stage of development. This, this idea that there is something more than ourselves uh, seems to be universal within humans.
We also find these Venus figurines, Venus figurines. Um, this is an umbrella term for these uh, fertility statuettes, these female statuettes found from Central Europe all the way into Europe. They date from about 35,000 years ago to 11,000 years ago. Uh, they are made of soft clay, um, uh, sorry, clay, soft stone, ivory, um, and they all have certain things in common. And again, from Central, uh, 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 from, from, from Eastern Europe, Western Asia into the Iberian Peninsula here, we find these Venus figurines. Um, what were they? Well, we don't know, but we can speculate. We can speculate. Um, were they fertility amulets? It would make sense considering their shape, considering their shape that these were fertility amulets. Um, some historians, especially in the 1970s, tried to posit that this is proof of a matriarchal uh, a paleolithic society where women were equal, if not superior to men, that where goddesses were worshiped. We have to be careful of that. We have to be careful of that because we don't know. We don't know. We have to be very careful of putting in our own hopes into what we find as historians. But they are certainly um, uh, built in a similar fashion. And remember, you have to have certain amount of calories in order to even produce offspring. And so a woman who was shaped like this would have been seen as very fertile, very desirable if you wanted to have offspring. The Mesolithic age, we are entering the middle stone age. See how we are breezing through this? The Mesolithic age, approximately 12,000 to 8,000 BC. E. Now, it is during the Mesolithic Age that the Ice Age ends, our last Ice Age, although there's been several. And so giant sheets of ice begin to pull back from the Northern Hemisphere, exposing a new land and rising, raising, raising the sea levels across the world. This will witness a great many changes. Our uh, uh, Earth begins to warm up. Dense forests become grasslands, and human technologies respond to these changes. This is when we begin to see uh, a, a tremendous development in our, in our uh, 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 tools, our weapons, even our jewelry. Advances of the Mesolithic Age, human advances of the Mesolithic Age, where well, we begin to um, develop more tools. As I said, uh, we also produce log rafts, dugouts, literally tree dugout, so that you can now take on the waterfront. Um, we see the uh, development of pots, of baskets, um, animal domestication we see during the Mesolithic age. Uh, for example, the cow, although dogs much earlier, dogs much earlier. Um, it's a common saying that we didn't choose dogs, dogs chose us. We're sitting at the fire and one clever dog says, you know what, I could hunt all day with my friends or I can just sit here and, 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 and look really cute. And I'll tell you what, you feed me and I'll protect you. I'll go hunting with you. I will bark anytime someone came uh, nearby. Just give me one of those bones. Uh, and so dogs probably chose us rather than we uh, chose them. What this means during this time with the domestication of certain animals like sheep, cattle, et cetera, greater food production, which means a greater population. We have a tremendous population increase during this time. Um, we also see migration and a few settlements. We see a few settlements here and there. However, for the most part, most humans are still living as nomads in bands of about 40 to 60 individuals uh, during this time, the Mesolithic age. You see here, great sheets of ice begin to pull back. They begin to pull back, exposing uh, uh, parts of, 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 of the continents, um, but also rising the seawater, rising the seawater uh, across the world. Great beasts like these begin to be less and less and less. And so we need to change our lifestyle. We can no longer simply rely on these animals. Now, for a hunter, you only had to hunt one of these things twice a week, 
twice a week, and the rest was a lot of downtime. Well, when these begin to disappear, we now have to hunt smaller animals. Um, we have to hunt things like deer uh, 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 and other small beasts. And so it forces us to change our lifestyles. These dense forests now open up to giant grasslands across Eurasia and Africa and North America. We see the rise of these vast, vast grasslands, which forces humans, if we're going to survive, we have to adapt. And that is the one thing about humans. And that's why we're found in so many different places. We can adapt. We can adapt. And we do. We certainly do. The Neolithic Revolution. The Neolithic Revolution. This is the new Stone Age. This is the final Stone Age. This is a period of human development where we really begin to move things forward. This witnesses the invention of agriculture, the creation of cities. This is the beginnings, the beginnings of civilization. However, again, much of the world will remain in a so-called Stone Age right up until the 1800s. So we're just we're focusing on uh, areas of the world that see this tremendous shift. And this begins during the Neolithic Revolution. Life as we know it, as we had known it for many thousands of years, will change forever. Um, I came across this on the internet. And this says it all. This is before the Neolithic Revolution on the left, uh, after the Neolithic Revolution on the right. You don't have to take any more classes. You've got it. You've got it. You've got it. This is all you need to know. On the left, we're hunting and gathering. On the right, we've domesticated a dog and we've got our uh, farm protected by a fence and we're living in a home. That's it. That's all you need to know. That's it. Done deal, pal. That is it. I'm going to give you more details, but just so you know, that's pretty much all you need to know. The birth of agriculture was witnessed during the Neolithic age. It literally revolutionizes life forever. However, it wasn't a sudden revolution. Just know this takes many hundreds and thousands of years. We will be partly nomadic hunter-gatherer while we're experimenting with agriculture. This shift from no longer being uh, purely nomadic and hunter-gatherer to being agriculture does not happen overnight by any, any, any means. Background on the birth of agriculture. Well, two things occur. Two things occur during the Neolithic age when the Ice Age ends. Population increase. And so we are pressed. We are pressed for more food along with a climate change, right? Um, it creates more food demands with a greater population, greater food demands. And the retreat, as I said, of those big game animals. And so we are forced to hunt other animals, deer and boar, but that doesn't fill the void that's needed. Humans then have to turn to smaller game and locate new food. We have to locate new food. And so we turn to wild grains, berries increasingly. We begin to plant seeds at first by accident. What if we all eat? What if we all eat berries uh, next to this rock? And it's something that we do. It's something that we do. We spit them out. <laughs> right? Although you don't spit up berries, but you get the idea. And then suddenly you notice, wait, they grow. They grow in the same spot. That's the spark. That's the spark. This idea that I can control with this seed, if I make the environment right, I can now conquer nature. I can now produce in the same spot over and over food enough to survive. We begin to experiment with different seeds. We begin to save the more hardy plants and we take the seed from them, disposing of the less hardy plants, right? This is a selective breeding with our plant life. This is what helps us to create an agricultural revolution. Increasingly, increasingly by 9,000 BCE, we are becoming more and more uh, uh, reliant on these uh, grains, whether it be by planting them or simply relying on them because we have a greater, uh, hunger is the great motivator, right? Hunger is the great motivator of history. And so you begin to experiment, you begin to uh, try various forms of food. Now, development, development. Um, the, 
domestication of, 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 of sheep, pigs, cattle, goats occurs in the Middle East. From Iraq up into Turkey, you can see here uh, goats 11,000 years ago, cattle 10 years ago, sheep 11,000 years ago, pigs 10 and a half thousand years ago. Um, by 9,000 BCE, that we can be sure of, by 9,000 BCE, uh, animals are being domesticated in the Middle East. Um, we also see at this time the rise of nomadic herding communities, right? They don't settle down to cities, but they go with these great herds of sheep or goats uh, across uh, wild lands to feed their herds. Now, they don't settle down, um, but some people begin to settle down. The effects of agriculture. Well, now we can support much larger population. Now we can support a much larger population, but we have to settle. We have to settle and we have to protect those lands. We can't have a nomadic tribe with their sheep come through and eat all of our grain. And so we have to stay and we have to protect. It's much more labor intensive than hunting. Farming is much more labor intensive. We have to uh, uh, day in, day out, toil in the fields, protect our fields. And this actually creates a tension between those nomadic herding communities that live in the hills and the wilds and those settled communities. And this tension between settled and unsettled humans will last uh, for thousands, many, many thousands of years. In some parts of the world, it still exists, that tension between the wild uh, uh, herders of the hills and the settled communities of the valleys. That tension does not go away. Um, with this domestication of, of plants, and animals, we see a tremendous population increase in the world. Before agriculture, globally, the population was between five and eight million people, between five and eight million people. By 4,000 BCE, by 4,000 BCE, we have between 60 and 70 million people. And that's just the beginning. That is just the beginning. Um, and so we're getting somewhere. We are getting somewhere. You can see here, various parts of the world have domesticated uh, various plants at different times. Um, in the Mediterranean, asparagus, cabbage, grapes, etc. cetera. Uh, wheat, barley, lentils, chickpeas uh, in the Middle East. Rice in Southeast Asia, 5,000 BCE. That allows enough calories just through rice in order to survive. What a revolution and a necessity for building civilization. Um, and again, this map shows a great many uh, various areas and the date of when those uh, species were domesticated. This is an interesting map showing uh, the spread of farming from Southwest Asia, the Middle East into Europe. And again, this happens over many thousands of years, many thousands of years. And by 4,000 BCE, we see the beginnings of agriculture in Scandinavia. Uh, South, Eastern, Great Britain, etc. Now, it's interesting to see what you can do with breeding and crossbreeding. I'm going to show you. This is not from the Paleolithic or Neolithic age. This is a watermelon from the 1600s. This is what watermelons look like. This is a painting of a watermelon, a partial uh, painting uh, that, you know, I've cropped it to, to show your watermelon. Look how much rind is there, but through breeding and crossbreeding, farmers have created this. And that's just in 400 years. That's just in 400 years, what you can do through breeding and you, you, you choose certain, certain traits of the plant. Um, and any farmer knows this now, right? Uh, you, you choose certain traits and you breed it with another seedling of that uh, same trait. This, you would not believe, is a earlier form of your modern day banana. This is an earlier form, and you won't believe this, uh, of the eggplant, right? Through breeding and crossbreeding. Uh, what if I told you this is the humble beginnings of the uh, uh, modern day carrot, all right? So you can see how, and that was just, that's not necessarily Neolithic. I'm just showing you what is possible through breeding and crossbreeding of various uh, foodstuffs. Towards civilization. Now we're getting towards civilization. Civilization. We've settled down. We're uh, uh, experimenting with 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 different forms of 
of farming, we're developing language, we're uh, having to get along with our neighbors, we are moving towards civilization. With civilization comes specialization. What do I mean by this? Well, agriculture allows, doesn't necessarily dictate that this occurs, but it allows for some people not to be farmers because the food yield is higher than the population. And so some humans might become metal workers. They are specializing. Some humans might become potters, et cetera. Some humans might become priests. They don't have to farm. They can do other things. And so this is how we're moving towards civilization with specialization. Agricultural work is hard. Agricultural work is hard. And so it requires a day off. And so this is the beginnings of ritual. All right. With agriculture, you need a day off. You work four to nine days, but then you need a, a day off. And so these societies begin to develop a calendar, not just for your days off. No, no, no. For harvest, for when to plant. And so you have to develop a calendar. That's the basis of civilization. Now we're starting to structure our, our lives with your day off. You might mark it with a religious ceremony. So now we are building some sort of organized faith. You see how agriculture leads to civilization. The two uh, work concurrently, not necessarily concurrently, but they work concurrently. Um, and also when you are settled and you're working together and you're sharing the same uh, religious ceremonies, the same language, the same goods, we have the beginnings, the beginnings, the same language, if I didn't say that already, the beginnings of some sort of identity. We are us, we are not like them, right? Uh, and so you begin to build society. We are inching towards civilization. We might not have a written language yet, but we're getting there. We are getting there towards civilization and that's needed that uh, agriculture is needed for that to take place. What was society like in these Neolithic uh, 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 world? We don't know, we don't know a great deal. We don't know a great deal. We know that there was forms of religion, there was forms of religion, um, and we know that it was uh, uh, most likely uh, a patriarchy, certainly a patriarchy. What is a patriarchy in these uh, early uh, societies? Well, a patriarchy, it, clearly, is a society dominated or ruled by men. Now, all of these Neolithic societies vary in forms of patriarchy, right? Various extremes, various extremes. There's many theories. Why do these early agricultural societies uh, uh, always tend to be patriarchies? Well, there's a number of reasons. Agriculture. Agriculture introduced this concept of property right? My land produces for me. I own that land. That is agriculture. And so men in these societies took that concept and applied it to their wives. They are mine. They produce for me. It's also a way of controlling a woman's sexuality. Patriarchies are much more stringent with women allowing to express their sexuality. Why would that be? In an agricultural society, you pass on your land to your son. In a hunter-gatherer society, you don't have anything to pass on, maybe your spear. But now I have acreage, right? I have this land. I have to pass it on to my son, or at least I want to. Well, I have to know that my son is mine. And so patriarchal societies become much more controlling of women. Women are also spending a lot more time in agricultural societies in the home because children now are important. You want children because they work your land. It's not like a hunter-gatherer society. And so women are spending much more time raising children, giving birth. They are in the home and they're seen more and more like property. In uh, non-agricultural societies, uh, divorce is much more easy, is easier. Um, uh, and a woman's sexuality is not controlled the way it is in a patriarchal agricultural society and that's just the reality of it and so we begin to see patriarchies established across uh, the neolithic age metalworking develops during this time about 4000 bce metalworking begins um we have permanent houses 
we have to work on irrigation. We have to work collectively. We need more advanced tools like hose, uh, 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 spades, et cetera. And so they begin to develop agriculture. I mean, agriculture, pardon me, metalworking. Um, many of the things that they are developing in this time weren't suited for stone tools, certainly not wood tools. And so uh, metalworking begins to develop um, in the Middle East first, and then it fans out across the world. And so during the Neolithic age, we begin to see um, the beginnings of metalworking, not just tools, but we also begin to see a uh, jewelry, et cetera. We will soon begin to see settlements, settlements across modern day Iraq into modern day Turkey, down into modern day Israel. With agriculture comes settlements. I can't leave my land. I have to stay with it. I have to stay with it. By, by 7500 BCE, we see the development of settlements with irrigation programs, walls for defense. Remember, we have to guard ourselves, not just against those nomadic herdsmen who come down and raid us, but perhaps against other settlements. These aren't empires. These aren't vast kingdoms. These are city-states, um, usually with a, uh, a chief or a king. You, you can use the term uh, uh, whichever way you like, uh, oftentimes with a divine uh, 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 um, application towards these leaders. You might have a bigger city in charge of a smaller city, but these are city-states. These are city-states that are developing. Um, again, because of agriculture, because of agriculture, we can't leave. We can't leave. We also have communication between these city states, which allows for um, knowledge to be passed from, say, uh, modern day Iraq. New technologies can be passed all the way to uh, modern day Israel. And so settlement is key in the development of civilization. We also have to start keeping records of things and so that you'll see the beginnings of a written language. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Now, one of the oldest of these settlements is Chattahoek. Chattahoek, I know I am pronouncing that badly, but as close as I can get, uh, Chattahoek um, in modern day Turkey, Southern Turkey, uh, Anatolia is what it was called for, for, for many, many, many years. Um, this peninsula, the Anatolian Peninsula, is very rich in history. And what we have in modern day Turkey, in Southern Turkey, is a fairly, fairly uh, 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 remarkable preserved ancient city. Um, established 7,000 BCE, about 9,000 years ago, in the rolling hills of Southern Turkey, they found a, uh, a, a, a Neolithic settlement um, discovered in 1958, 32 acres, 32 acres. It usually supported a population of between eight and 5,000 people, remarkable. But this is a prime example of one of these early settlements. Not the first, not the first, but a very, very, very well-preserved example. Um, Interestingly enough, we don't have roads and we don't have front doors in these houses. Um, they traveled on the rooftops. They entered a home through a rooftop. And this was a form of defense. You can see along the side here, this is obviously a recreation. Uh, along the side here, there's no way to get in. Um, we know that many of these uh, inhabitants were quite clumsy because we have broken bones, uh, legs, collarbones uh, from falling from these roofs. Um, but this is one of the earliest settlements, one of the earliest settlements by 3000 BC. Uh, this is just one of many. This is just one of many. Uh, this is what it may have looked like. Largely peaceful, dealing with their neighbors. Now they traded within their own and they traded with other city states, but they also dealt with those uh, nomadic herdsmen in the hills. Uh, there's evidence of that. These are recreations of what those homes would have looked like. Again, by 3,000, we have hundreds of these agricultural settlements ranging from Anatolia, modern day Turkey, all the way into modern Pakistan and India. A great many, and this is the birth of civilization. This is the birth of civilization. Um, in our next lesson, 
in our next lesson, we will go to the birthplace of civilization, according to everything that we know, and that is between the Tigris and the Euphrates, Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, right there, right there, where civilization appears to have taken off before other locations. Uh, thank you very, very much. Until we meet again.